Hey guys, Andy N, Spoken Label, back in the house on a Sunday afternoon. Hey, it's going to be a busy day today because Spoken Label's cocked up. Where, but this podcast, which is planned today, is great. I've got a wonderful lady with me. I'm going to in a second. But unknown to me, I've agreed to do another podcast in a couple of hours' time and completely forgot about it. So <laughs> that one's going to be a bit messy. But anyway, we're, we're over to my favourite paisley in the world today, the place I was born, near yeah, Stretford. Now, this is great because we've got a poet here today, actually, who's not from the Stretford area originally, but has been living up there for a while. And bizarrely enough, we've just found out she lives on the corner of my parents, so it, it really is a small world. So we've got the fantastic Emma with us today. Now, Emma, I'm going to let you introduce yourself. Tell people, obviously, a little bit about yourself as a person, where you're from originally, and what starts you off all your creativity? We'll start from there. Yeah, okay. So um, I'm originally from Bury, so I'm not far from Stretford. Yeah, I'm going um, to correct people, Bury. Right. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I say Bury, and I'm from there. <laughs> I think different people can say how they like, can't they? Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, people will be correcting me, Bury. Um, and I I was talking to my mum this morning about um, why, why I'm... I write and why I'm really into poetry and um, she was saying that I've been writing poems since before I could write and she used to write them down for me and she and she got oh, one wow. and this is the first one I ever the first poem I ever wrote which was before I could write um, oh, wow. he's very flightful I catch him in in two hands one hand isn't enough <laughs> oh that's brilliant I'm, I'm really about... wow yeah. I know I started when I was about 10 and I was, I'll send you over one of my 10 year old ones later on and they're in the other room and they're in, in a big box It's and really I, cringe though isn't it reading stuff that you've written really yeah. okay. Well the second the second one I was remembering me and we'll go back to you in a second I promise you was I wrote one about the school trip to Chester Zoo at um, Barton Clough which is obviously not far, that far away from where you live and I got a one week detention for it because I didn't like the teacher very much. And I imagined the lions breaking out the cage and killing the te- one of the teachers. Well, that was your poem. That was second poem. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. So, so anyway, so oh. anyway, thankfully that teacher's well dead now. So they can't, they can't <laughs> go back in with detentions again. Now, <laughs> what I think the crunch point of yourself seems to have been, obviously, is like obviously. People read to research and they know you're dyslexic, aren't they? So yeah. When did you find yeah. out you were dyslexic? Um, in year four, I think my oh, my mum had suspicions. You were very early then, weren't you? So yeah. Yeah, for for my for our generation. <laughs> yeah. well, my generation, yeah. you know, how old I was. I was twenty eight when I found out. Well, because dyslexia wasn't really a thing thing in the no. 80s and 90s was it so not at all not at all um so it was it was quite early considering it was the 90s um and my mum sent me to a tutor who's I remember her Felicia Isaacs I remember sitting in her back back room and the only instruction my mum had given her was I don't care what she writes as long as she enjoys it and um so I would sit in Felicia Isaacs back room writing poetry and and that's obviously what I wanted to do I wanted to write poems I wanted to write and I wanted to um yeah and it's just really strange because it's been such a struggle actually writing things down um but because all of these ideas in your head that you know trying to well, what what how do I get that out of my brain um yeah and, I had a lot of trouble at university straight away when I did it I was back yeah. in what the late late uh, early 2000s I discovered it, it was just it was a shock mm. to the system really it was because like it's I'd spent my full life like struggling really struggling yeah. And that was like a trigger, basically. It helped me understand things. I suppose it did. your case was coming much earlier, really, wasn't it? So it was like... Yeah. Um, yeah, it was... It was. I think it's a lot easier the earlier that it's recognised. Um, there wasn't a, a great deal of support, <laughs> support for it. Cause there were, I mean, and there were still teachers don't believe in it. When I did my education studies degree, one of the tutors on my um, in my um, on my degree said that we were saying that middle that um dyslexia is an excuse for the thick children of middle class parents <laughs> just oh, I I was like, and it, he's, he's teaching this generation you know he's teaching teachers it's appalling yeah so that, I, that, I have an ongoing battle with my dad and my dad's 88 now when i came register this my dad said at the time well, it doesn't exist he did refuse to believe it and it yeah. took him 20 years to his late 70s he actually believed me so mm. it's like it's 
yeah. it does it's i think it's a big shock people system that's why and it's yeah i think the trigger of me like i was writing poetry and it's similar yeah. to you really that's why like it's when i go into that zone i don't tend to make half the errors i make on letters and stuff like that it's there's something it's, it's like a trigger isn't it really so it's about processing it's about the way that your mm. brain processes things that are more important <laughs> it's yeah. just more important and and you know your own work things that you care about are a lot easier to put the effort in your brain's more engaged so things that you are that you care more about are easier um and i think it's probably like that for everyone um but especially if you've got sort of additional um neuro spiciness going on oh yeah plan me out i've got all kinds of, there's not a list of things i've got with me wrong with me i <laughs> yeah. can i could spend about an hour going through you and you'd be saying how the hell am I still smiling over it? I think if you don't, if you don't, you cry sometimes. Now, I suppose it's probably the best way to tell people how, how we got in contact with each other, first of all, because mm-hmm. this is a few mutual friend of ours, Helen Kay, the oh, wonderful Helen Kay Helen. now. I yeah. love Helen. I met Helen all like, years ago when I've done the Spoken Label podcast for way before lockdown. i a fantastic lady. And she does her own website for a couple of years now called dyslexiapoetry.co.uk. I, if people look around, they can find one of my poems in there for a couple of years ago. And, and and that's how we got talking originally because what I she recommended you to me and so well, we got your poem that's on there and it's a fantastic poem it really really is and I it was really charming when I read it that's why and it's your poem itself now obviously tell people about then and um, what's made you want to get some of your poems published in places like in Helen's website well I used to this is um confessions now i used to write for a living oh did you oh, um, i whoa. used to be a ghostwriter oh whoa. i used to get paid 700 dollars per novel from some trash publishing company oh, in whoa. america oh wow um, he caught, caught me out with that one i wasn't expecting that one <laughs> brilliant and it was awful and the um and it was a really horrible, really horrible experience. Don't do it, guys. Um, because, you know, piecework anyway is no fun because you've got to put however many hours it is to take mm. it to do it. And $700 after fees, after it's not fees and paper fees. It's about 300 quid for about a month's worth, you know, writing a novel. It's a lot of money. Um, it's a lot of time, rather. Um, what did you um, do? Did you, did you, I know, long story short, Amanda, my wife, did it briefly. And it's and she couldn't couldn't do it, so she quit pretty quick. And it would work. She wrote out she'd have to work about what write about fifteen thousand words a week on it minimum. Yours must have been something similar. I, when I don't care about the quality, I can write seven thousand words a day. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. So yeah, seven thousand words a day um, was what I used to do, but I didn't care about the quality by the end, um, and. I was just, I was like, right, do you know what? I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm going to um, do it for myself. So I set up a little um, uh, publishing um, imprint, which yeah. is really easy. Anyone can do it. Um, and um, and I publish, and started publishing my stuff, a few um, compilations of other people's poems. Um, and then I think a lot of people changed their perspective on what was going on during lockdown and I wanted to be able to share my children's poems and my children's stories and I, it became more and more obvious that it wasn't going to work in physical form because you don't have access to shops, you don't have access to um, the normal outlets and it just wasn't going to be, um, wasn't going to work. People weren't going to be able to access it. And also, not everyone can afford to buy however many books for their children. And they want people want to read to their kids, most parents, but they can't always afford to have to, to you know to just be buying books all the time. And libraries are shut in left, right, and centre. I don't oh, want to get are. political, but well, we can get political. Going on. There's <laughs> contra- controversy around Stratford's library at the moment, but we'll come on to that oh, another yeah. day, right? <laughs> See, I yeah. hear things, even though I don't live in the area, right? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so there's all sorts going on. And I'm writing these poems and these stories for children. And uh, so I thought one of the one way to be able to sort of um, 
allow people to access it is to put them on YouTube. So that's what I do with um, my illustrated poems and my short stories for children. Um, and I put the text up there because not all parents who want to read to the children can. I mean, it's <laughs> it's, a, it's a reality. Not everyone can. Um, so the text's up and I'm reading this. So it's a read along um, uh, for with the poems and the um, stories. And then I've started to do um, some of the notes for my GCSE English classes as well, because I teach online. I, I do private tutoring and I'm going to say all of my students are have an additional need of some sort. Um, and if it's dyslexia, ADHD, autism, some sort of um, processing disorder, those are children who will a lose all their notes immediately anyway. B don't start, forget don't start me on that. Yeah, I'm <laughs> atrocious. Yeah. were you like that growing up? Were you losing notes oh, all the just time? stuff everywhere? Yeah, don't know yeah. where anything is. I'm still like that now. So. <laughs> yeah. Um. And and so it's on YouTube for them. So if we have the lesson, I, I send them the notes, but I've read the notes out, um, and written them down, and so it's on YouTube, and they can get at it. And they can rewatch it because if you need to overlearn stuff, you need to be able to re hear it and re see it over and over again. Um, and depending on how their processing stuff works, so that's what's that's what that is. So it's mainly it's sort of evolved into mainly um GCSE English revision for my students, <laughs> but oh, I am yeah. still, I am still doing poems and putting them up there. I've got some in the pipelines I'm writing at the moment. Yeah, I was playing them all back this morning, and there's five in there of yours, and they're all brilliant. Because I'd love to really do the illustrations of it. So can you, yeah. can you go through this button? I call, we'll call it storyboarding. I'm not sure whether it's applicable yeah. in this case. But, yeah, we'll call it storyboarding anyway. So tell us about the storyboarding when your poems are bought then. So when you're doing them, do you have the hmm. illustrations in mind when the poem's finished, or do you do that when you're looking at doing a video for them? So I do the illustrations after after the poem, and I go to I have I go to Canva, um, and I use um, and there's a few illustr illustrators on Canva that I that I'm really big fan of, and I use a lot of their stuff. And when when I do print books, all of their um, all of their acts are in the book. They're credited all in the book because even though I'm not, you know, there's no um, obligation to. I think it's nice. <laughs> It's nice to just let people know who who's who's done whose work it is that I'm that I'm working with, um, and then I um curate the illustration. So I I I will create out of several different types of backgrounds. Maybe there's different elements in, so they all come as separate elements that you have to combine. I just can't draw, um, so <laughs> join the club. <laughs> a right? level three D design can't draw. <laughs> well, I got. I remember this my case was and when I was at Lost Stop School was your no. Right. So that's where I that's where I did my secondary acts. And um, they actually loved my I, I won an award I did in the second year at secondary for art of a experimental version of wood of um, waves in the sea. Oh, but I'm yeah. colourblind. So I, I ended up doing the sea in pink, thinking it was like blue. Yeah, because it's that sort of pale. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I completely don't Typical me, but yeah, I know what you mean. But you do like it. It doesn't stop you sometimes. You can't do it. <laughs> so, but yeah, you know, obviously, referring back to obviously what you're doing, there, saying like it's yeah, it's it is really, really, I think it's really, really good stuff that you're doing here on this. But on your YouTube channel itself, then, have to has this took off in a way that you weren't expecting because there's so much quad content there. People look at it. Um, I so when I had my door to last last mm. February I can't work out when where we were up <laughs> so about a year and a half ago um I um wrote the I'm coming to the world poem for her ah, um, ah. and and I thought well, I better put that up but I mean there was already stuff on there there was my chicken stuff on there um lots of videos of <laughs> about me following around this is a chicken that I'm filming these are my chickens this is some things the chickens are eating it was not very exciting <laughs> Where did your rescue hens come from? Because I know it's actually in your bio. Yeah, obviously people are wondering you let you live in straight from your partner, your daughter, and rescue hens. Yeah. So um the commercial egg industry um 
a band sort of rejects its hens at 18 months old, that's their cutoff point usually. So 18 months old, these aren't commercially viable anymore, get rid. And they're usually either made into dog food or fertiliser at that stage. Oh, right. Um, oh, wow. But there's a few organisations that um, Lucky Hens in Wigan, who I'm getting yeah. my next lot from, um, and Fresh Start for Hens, they're a national charity. There's a few of them that will go and pick up these hens um, en masse and then take them to a collection point and then you go and you say I want four and then you turn up and you take away seven because chicken maths and then um, and then you go off and, and have you and have chickens and then they continue oh. to lay all my hens um, that I've had rescue hens that I've had have continued to lay for years after their, their commercial viability ran out um, and the farmers don't want to have the hens turned into dog food you know they they don't they're not cruel people but they have to be able to make money from it and so when charities say oh we'll take them off your hands they're more than happy to have that happen they're really some of them are really um really helpful and like help the charities put them in the in the vans and stuff um so but yeah so <laughs> not a garden full of chicken i was just trying to imagine that because there's somebody that lives in the back of where we are in Denton has got that. And you can see someone like about 30 or 40 chicken um hens walking around his front garden. Yeah. And that's why I thought of you then straight away. And his neighbours hate him because they're, they're always making love. They're up <laughs> when they're on some... she would say they're on season. That they could be at it all night sometimes or I keep getting told. Well it's when they're laying they say they sing this egg song and it's ridiculously loud they call it the egg song and it's not a song at all it sounds like they are being tortured <laughs> it's horrible noise that comes out yeah and we had one chicken that would sing the she'd stop laying and she carried on singing the egg song whenever anyone else laid she's like oh there's an egg <laughs> like, it's not your egg <laughs> it's not your egg miriam come down and she's like no there's an egg oh yes but it's not oh, yours. No. Get away. Oh, no. Oh, no. I, can, I, can, I can imagine that's all I'm going to say, definitely, with that. <laughs> anyway, let's, let's get back to your writing anyway, then, because that's what mm. we're really here for today. Although it's fascinating, <laughs> right? your, your, your hen, hen stories. And do you have any sort more plans for your um, creativity, then? Where do you think you'll go next to it? Um, I've got a few more poems, child, children's poems, I want to do. Um, So... The jungle jellyfish one I really liked. Well, people, we um, will be will be hearing that in the second half, and I <laughs> adore that one. Um, and that had that had about five thousand views. I was really impressed. Um, but I'm doing a another one, but it's sort of mental health themed, and, and I think because I keep snails as well at the moment. Um, oh, do you? Oh, whoa! Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm currently breeding <laughs> giant land snails. <laughs> So what are you like the good life? You like the good life, and are you having like a zoo for a zoo in your house? And basically, <laughs> well, my partner's not massively into the snails, so they they live in the in, in the garage. We call it my laboratoire. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna. I've got a, a story in my head about um about just taking things at a snail's pace and just slowing things down and taking your own sweet time, um, which I think might be quite a, a nice one. I've got. Um, um yeah i've got got stuff percolating up there um i think um i've got what i need to do is another spelling story because um i did a story called ite um well i've got hairy toes about how to make the ite sound <laughs> um and it's about a little monkey oh, who gets really cross because no one says his, no one can remember his name and he goes around shouting i've got hairy toes um which is a little spelling one. So I've got another one called Oh You Grumpy Hippo about an ooh sound. Ooh. Um <laughs> that I need to get on with as well. So yeah, so a nice slow snail and a grumpy hippo. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Now if people will research and listen to your poems. I, I, my, my favourite one was when uh, Amanda the panda came into it because <laughs> most because my wife's called Amanda, that's why, right? Oh so. yes. Yeah, so a baby bean can't find camel. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to play um, that one to Amanda later on because I know she's going to love that one. She's not heard <laughs> it yet. So, <laughs> brilliant. Okay, we'll wrap up part one here anyway. I just want to give you a chance to read a few pieces out in the second half for us. Uh, we'll do the hard sell. Okay. If you want people to find out more about you, where do you recommend they go? Um, 
what's my own YouTube called? <laughs> uh, <laughs> reading, I don't know. It's Reading Room Publishing Pro Projects is my YouTube, and it's all on there. Um, there's the children's poems, the chickens, <laughs> and the and the English revision, and I think there might even be a, a very old video of a Gambian poacher um, eating an Agatha Christie novel on there somewhere. But... <laughs> Brilliant, great stuff. I thought it's been a pleasure. Right, we'll take a quick break. I want to give you a chance to read a few pieces after us, but I've enjoyed it. And yeah. take it for everybody, hang around for this because they put Emma's brilliant in the poetry. She really put a big smile on my face this morning when I was playing these back. So, see you all in a few minutes. <laughs> 